Welcome to the DRF Sports Betting Podcast, brought to you by DRF Sports. America's most trusted name in horse racing is now providing sports bettors with exclusive data, analytics, previews, videos, and expert picks on all major sports. Bet smarter and have more fun doing it. It's the DRF Sports Betting Podcast, and now your host, Sheldon Alexander. Ready, set, bet. This is the DRF Sports Podcast, episode three. Make sure you like and subscribe and follow wherever you get your podcasts. As always, I'm your host, Sheldon Alexander. And a reminder, we do this twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays, talking football and, of course, gambling. As mentioned, this is week three of a brand new project for DRF Sports. And if you're not familiar with us, Daily Racing Forum has been around for literally over 100 years, giving you all the information data, and analysis for your horse racing needs. But now we're taking over the sports betting world as well. Check out the website drf.com slash sports right now. And if you haven't signed up yet for a free DRF sports account, you can do so. Again, drf.com slash sports to get the latest odds, exclusive trends, projected winners, betting insights, and the 100-page 2021 football betting guide. You'll also receive free digital newsletters delivered to your inbox every Friday and Sunday. If you missed this past Sunday's edition, then you missed a trifecta of powerful betting angles that included a pair of underdogs winning outright, the Steelers' victory in Buffalo, and the Saints trouncing the Packers. Also highlighted was an angle on the Rams ahead of their 20-point blowout of the Bears on Sunday night. Essentially, if you haven't signed up, you're missing out, and no one wants to do that, right? So make sure that you sign up right now. But for now, you've at least done one thing correct as you've tuned back into this podcast where we've just been handing out winners. Week one of the NFL included a whole bunch of winners, including the Raiders plus four on Monday night. And what a game that was. What a week it was as I finished 11 and five to start this season. But there was someone who had a way better week than that. So I had to invite him back on the pod so we can chop it up again course his name is matt russell and we're going to discuss what we learned from week one in the nfl recap a massive upset in the ncaa and make some midweek thursday night football picks all that and more with matt russell of the score and he joins me right now Well, 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 I asked him to join us this week and part of me was actually surprised that he said yes, because I thought he might have taken all his winnings from week one and just ran away. (laughs) What a week of picks for this guy. I know he helped me a lot on an 11 and five week and I still didn't listen as much as I should have last week. But either way, I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Matt Russell of the score back to the podcast. My dude, how you doing? Man, uh, if if the audio back here is, is a little sketchy, it's because construction work has started on the gold doubloon silo that we're going to build out back after week one. Um, you know, I got to work on my backstroke, front stroke, et cetera, et cetera here, you know, as, I, as I'm going to be swimming uh, in gold doubloons. Uh, the bad news is we set this bar, right? <laughs> like we talked last week about setting a bar for these football teams. We went and did something stupid. We set the bar mega high when it came to this podcast and the picks basically winning everything last week and so now you know if we just have a small winning week or something like that we're gonna look like a couple idiots and god forbid we actually have a losing week which by the way everybody it happens right that's the name of the game now hopefully we don't go oh and nine to match like the nine and oh that we went last week um (laughs) You know, so hopefully we can tamper that down from, from a losing standpoint. But everybody, let's just remain calm. Nobody freak out out there, right? We're, you know, we had a nice first week in a lot of cases, depending on how you played things, you probably kind of paid for the rest of the season uh, with some of these bets. Uh, but yeah, like what, what an absolutely ridiculous week one, uh, five and zero in Vegas contest. We hit this Carolina Panthers survivor pick, which is a little out on the limb. And a lot of people would say like, You know, yeah, but San Francisco, L.A., like those teams won as well. But if you took Carolina and Survivor, you've got yourself a nice little path here, not using one of those top two teams that I think looked pretty good on Sunday. I mean, as you said, what a time to be alive for sure. And 
I'm pretty sure I, I was looking, I was kind of squinting as I was watching the game last night because I wasn't sure if it was you or not in part of that end zone club they got there in Vegas as they opened up <laughs> the first game with fans ever in Vegas, which was just absolutely incredible. But I want to let you <laughs> brag a little bit and talk that talk. And, you know, this little thing I've heard about a round robin money line parlay. Can you break a little yeah. bit of that down for us? Yeah, that's getting a lot of traction. And, and, and who knew? Again, speaking of speaking of keeping the bar high, um, you know, first and foremost, got to talk about last night, the Raiders game, uh, you know, insane for the second straight week or the second straight podcast. You and I are peeling ourselves off the ceiling, you know, try, uh, it, peeling ourselves out of bed in the morning to get this podcast <laughs> done because that game is so outrageous. And listen, I wish I was sitting next to Boog pregame having some of that jumbo shrimp that those guys were working on, like loving that. Uh, mm-hmm. The round robin parlay. Um, so basically how this works is, you know, it's sort of a lottery ticket of NFL betting, right? You go, okay, we're going to make a bunch of bets on Sunday. I imagine people listening to this probably have like double digit bets on Sunday. And so the round robin parlay is you take five teams, money line underdogs, and you parlay them in groups of three. So it ends up being 10 different combinations. And you can do one that is the entire five, you know, five team parlay. And you want to split one unit, right? So essentially 1.1 units, the same way that you would in a minus 110 spread bet. So that if you lose, right, maybe only two underdogs win, maybe zero underdogs win. Doesn't really matter, but you need at least three for it to be profitable. You'll often get, you know, double your money, maybe a little bit more than that. But if four win, it starts connecting all of the legs together. And if five win, everything (laughs) wins and you start construction on a gold doubloon silo. And so that's what happened this past week. And so a lot of people got excited about that. Um, so, you know, obviously I write about that every Wednesday over at the score. And so you can check that out, but you know, it's never going to be that good again. So yeah, we were able to turn around some of your picks from last week, turn those from losers into winners. I imagine we'll probably do the opposite at some point this season, but again, week one, uh, just hoping for the best, but yeah, at this point with that Monday night, we're staying positive here. We're staying positive. Yeah. Positive vibes vibes. only. Yeah. We don't really, (laughs) we don't really work that way in the betting industry. Right. It's like all negative. And it's like, if you lost one game, you're like, "Ah, I can't believe, you know, I'm still like rattled about the Dalvin Cook fumble because I had a small bet on the Vikings. And I'm like, he was down. It's like, Matt, (laughs) you did great, man. Like you can hand some back in in the case of a Dalvin Cook fumble. But that's just the that's just the way we treat things here in, in you know betting world. It's just the way things go. And what we're going to plan to do every single Tuesday, we'll take a quick look back at certain games to see what we learned about certain teams. So we have to start with the Monday Nighter. And as we said, crazy game, roller coaster ride. Raiders were plus four. And that was the play that we were on. But for the first time with fans, I can't believe how insane that scene was and just the ride of emotions that must have been. But let's try to frame it this way. How much are we upgrading the Raiders? Or are we downgrading the Ravens after that game? Like, how do you kind of view that? Yeah. So the funny thing is about having a really successful week one is it usually means that you had teams rated pretty appropriately, right? Like if you found value, for instance, we talked last week about the Chargers and like, I like the Chargers more than most people. I don't like Washington as much as most people. And so just fundamentally, that had to be a bet for me, even as I'm watching the line move up and it become a popular pick in this, in the contests in Vegas, I'm like, I have my ratings. My ratings are my ratings. And so mm-hmm. the thing with the Raiders and the Ravens is we were right, right? Like these teams yeah. are closer than people think, you know, and a part of that because of the Ravens injuries and that sort of thing, right? They were, you know, Derek Carr was able to finally start moving the ball and connecting with some of these receivers in part because the Ravens are missing two corners, I believe. And so when I look back and I go, I can't really bump the Raiders up that much because I watched that first half and like Derek Carr stressing me out. Right. And so I go and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to really bump them up that much. And I'm also not going to knock down the Ravens because I thought that was going to be a tricky spot for the Ravens. So I'm not going to make a big adjustment because again, we, you know, we have to remember it's one game here. So I'm not going to make too much of an adjustment on either of those teams because I think we were pretty correct in just thinking that that game was going to be really close. And if you think that game's going to be really close, you just take as many points as you can get and listen things got crazy in overtime and like doomsday guy over here is going the ravens are going to somehow score a (laughs) touchdown in overtime to cover like this is going to be the Uh, worst right like that's just that's just a life that we've chosen here so yeah i'm not i'm not going to make that much of an adjustment off of one game and like there's going to be teams that i make adjustments off of one game but i'm going to try to limit that as much as i possibly can because it's just one game 
Yeah. And that's the thing too. You look at a game like that where the spread is four points and I always try to look at things as, okay, well it's more than a field goal. And I think those teams are just way closer than, you know, being able to, to lay that many points. So in, at the end of the game, when you're seeing fumbles, you're seeing interceptions go off, like receivers hands off helmets into the air. You're seeing uh, the play clock run down <laughs> and them almost right. like icing their kicker, but they have no timeouts. So it's a penalty. It's just like, what is happening? In this <laughs> game, right. And that's where yeah. you, you, I fall into the, the normal trap. If you're listening to last week's pod, it's like, just take the points, right? <laughs> just take right. the points. But well, our theme, right, has always been like it's Plinko, right? Like or yeah. Plinko, it's musical chairs. That's our favorite one from 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 way back in the day, if you will. Yeah. Right? It's Plinko. Like at some point, like it, you know, the 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 puck is just kind of bouncing, 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 and then eventually it's going to stop in some slot, right? And it just happened to stop in Raiders by six. Like yeah. there's a bunch of different ways that could have been Raiders by three. There's a bunch of different ways that could have been Ravens by three. And of course there's a bunch of different ra- ways that could have been ra- Raiders by six, but you know, you look at it and you go, okay, like three's a win on either side for us. Right. And so obviously is Raiders by six. And so if we're going to get those three options, we're fine leaving that one fourth option. You know, obviously once we get to overtime or certainly late in the game, once it got tied, mm-hmm. especially the first time. Right. And so, yeah, like take, and this isn't again, general rule type thing. Right. But if this game is going to be close, yeah, the rate, the uh, Ravens might actually win the game by seven, but you know, that's going to be in the minority relative to yeah. some of these other options. So we rather be on the, yeah, rather be on the majority side of things when it comes to win probabilities. And in terms of sticking with that theme, as we move on to some of the other big games of the week, we were able to sniff out the Steelers upset, like outright upset against the Bills as six and a half point underdogs as they come out with a 23 to 16 win. And we were we were kind of all over that. That wasn't one of them that you needed to talk me into. I was right there with you behind the Mike Tomlin train. And I remember you talking about how Tomlin definitely would have been on these guys the whole offseason. You know, you guys are six and a half point dogs. And that defense was ready. But when you look at both of these teams, what did you kind of learn? Who are how are you, much are you bigging up the Steelers or maybe looking at the Bills? Are are you getting worried or is that too much to overreact to after week one? I think it's I think it's again that's another one that it's I just just too much to overreact to right and I know like yeah. Steelers fans are going to be like what we won like you know not giving <laughs> us any credit but again part of it is I was already giving you credit like that's what the money's for right like exactly. that's what the betting is for we talked about six and a half points is too many now listen if that game was lined at you know bills minus two and a half guess who would have lost that game I would have because I would have been on the bills right like there mm-hmm. isn't a ton of there's no magic to it, right? Especially when you have a week like this. Maybe there's a little magic in the air when you have a week like we had in week one, but like there's no magic to it, right? If we think it's four points and the line's six and a half, like we're going to take the Steelers. And that's going to mean that the money line's a little bit more valuable up in the plus 200 type of range. And these are just bets that you have to make and hope for the best. Now, did we expect, you know, was I breaking down punt, um, you know, blocking, <laughs> you know, film and going like, yep, Steelers are going to find some vulnerabilities here. Like, no, like that's just kind of the football stuff that happens, man. Random bleep happens yeah. in football all the time. And we were able to take advantage of that. What I take away from the Steelers is like, Benny boy, like not great, Bob. Like it was just, yeah. it was a rough scene for Ben for a really, really long time. Now, again, the, the takeaway from the Bills is they let the Steelers just, you know, hanging around, hanging around, right? Like they just let them linger for as long as possible. And eventually Roethlisberger made a couple of completions. They got the lead and then they got, you know, I'll throw, I'll say the word fluke, right? The fluke play on the punt block. And now all of a sudden, like we're in great shape for the money line, right? Does that mean I'm looking to fade the Steelers like in every game going forward? You know, we just talked about the Raiders, right? The Raiders have to peel themselves off you know, speaking of the ceiling, they've now got to go to Pittsburgh next week. It's like, yeah, do I, do I feel like six is a little much when I don't trust Pittsburgh's offense whatsoever? Kind of, but like, I don't know how the Raiders get back up for this game. So, you know, like I'm just, I, I'm just not looking like, the, okay, we need to upgrade the Steelers. It's like, I actually kind of would almost downgrade them. So I'm just going to leave them where uh, I have them. 
Same thing with the Bills, right? Like we saw a full season out of Josh Allen. I'm like, I'm not going to downgrade him off of one bad game, but I am a little worried, right? A little worried about like some inaccuracies there uh, with Allen. So yeah, no changes as far as those things are concerned. It's just one game, especially when we're talking punt blocks, which almost never happened in the NFL. (laughs) You know, you can't overreact. I got you. I got you. One thing that I'm, you're going to have to, to, hold me back here a little from overreacting to, but you ever so perfectly hunted down the saints upsetting the Packers. I was, I think my quote was Packers, Packers, Aaron Rodgers, Packers, close quote. And you were like, (laughs) Whoa, 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 wait a second here. Right. So the Packers as four point favorites, right. End up getting dummied 38 to three. Wow. Like, can we really yeah. not look at that game and kind of be a little worried about Aaron Rodgers and the Packers going forward? Yeah. But again, right. Like, you know, we were on that, we were on that mm-hmm. stoop, right. We were on that. We were here. ye here. Ying, right. Old timey, you know, style here. Um, again, 38 to three, like, was I finding an alt line minus 34 and a half? No. <laughs> right. Like didn't, didn't think it was going to be a blowout. Right. Just had, you know, just felt like this was too many points. And I felt like this on a neutral Saints Packers, you know, based on what I know about these teams felt like a pick em game to me. Right. And so that's why it was the red light special. Shout out TLC. Mm-hmm. It was the red light <laughs> special because it's like, you know what, we're getting plus 170 on a thing that I think is a pick em. Now, if we played that game again tomorrow, you know, you're not favoring the Saints by 35 points. You're not favoring the Saints by 10 points. You're probably not even favoring the Saints in the market, right? But it's not going to be four on a readjustment, right? It's probably yeah. going to be closer to pick them. And so like, yeah, we'll take the victory lap, not necessarily because the Saints won the game, but because that we were probably right beating the market to what that game should be now that we've seen those two teams play. And so, yeah, like everything that we talked about, you know, we went long, right? You just wanted like a minute on this game. I stopped. I, I, I dragged this podcast <laughs> to a halt on Friday by going like five or six minutes, maybe more on this game, because it's like the Saints are going to be able to run the ball. Check. The Saints defense is going to be able to get to Aaron Rodgers because he's not comfortable behind that offensive line. And he has known that since he requested you know, his walking papers out of town. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those two things right there, you throw in Jameis on a system, you know, he doesn't have to risk it. We talked about the no risk it, no biscuit with Tampa Bay, like risk it's in his motto. And so like, yeah, Jameis doesn't have to risk anything. Sean Payton's giving him easy throws, easy plays. You know, he's got five touchdown passes, but it's like little taps to, to Alvin Kamara. Right. And it's like, he's not exactly slinging it into double coverage here. And like, The offensive line, top five offensive line, it's giving him time to drop back and pass and find the wide open guy that Sean Payton has schemed up. So to me, again, like it's it's more about coaching. There's a lot of guys, you know, that we get all excited about from a playing standpoint because they're the athletes, they're making outstanding plays. But fundamentally, and it's trickier to do because you have to, you know, track offensive coordinators and defensive coordinators, right? But listen, you know, I, I hopefully you checked out the Manning uh broadcast in the game last I night. Did. But what that I really sort it. of it's awesome. And, and, you know, certainly for the first three quarters, fourth quarter, I'm like, ah, let's, it's winning time here. Let's get some play by play. But like the, for the first three quarters, you're watching them talk and they're pointing out the defenses. And you think like, there are so many defenses, right? Just like from a, you know, game planning standpoint. And, you know, the coaches are the ones moving these chess pieces around. So like, yeah, okay, this guy's out or this guy's playing well, or this guy's whatever, but it's like, the coaches are making this decision. Is it cover three? Is it cover zero? Like when did, when to blitz, when not to blitz, you know? And so you just go, okay, like we have to give some of these coaches as much as we get frustrated with them from a timeouts and challenging and all of these sorts of the dumb stuff that they do, whether not to go for it. And it's like, yeah, but from a game planning stuff, right? Like these are the guys who are making the difference. And so Sean Payton right now is making Jameis Winston just a serviceable quarterback with a pretty big arm, right? Who can test the deep ball, but doesn't have to the way that Bruce Arians asked him to do when he was over there. So does that mean we're buying the Saints every single week the rest of the way? Absolutely not. But right. It's just the point is, is like, these are the things that will give you an edge over other betters and other, you know, the marketplace who come in and just say, and, you know, not to sort of you know, call you out, but like, you know, who'll just say Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers. But it's like, you know, like if that were the case, they'd be 16 and 0 against the spread. 
right? And they're just not going to be. So um, yeah, that was, you know, we have to take our victory lap from that one because that was sort of the big focus from last week. For the record, I, I'm absolutely not offended at all by said comment. I, I am okay with that. I am totally uh, <laughs> confident and okay with my place and my role representing the people, the average fan here. So I'm okay. And the with money that. helps too, right? Winning the bets helps too. For sure. But hey, we're trying to learn. We're all here trying to learn, just get more information and help those bets be better week in, week out. And speaking of bets, we're super lucky. And this is one of the lessons I will say that I've learned over the years from this man, Mr. Matt Russell, in terms of getting in on lines early on in the week, because we're talking about my San Francisco 49ers early on in the week, seven and a half. By the time the game rolls around, that was up to eight and a half, nine. And if you saw how that game played out, there's a little thing called bad beats. And that might be one of the like worst, most insane beats I've ever seen as the Lions almost came back and won that game. Like what? Yeah. What's the lesson here? Like talk to people about what the lesson here in watching that game play out, even yeah. though it was complete insanity that you can't predict, but still line yeah. value right yeah yeah shopping right the, and the and the margins of which we're you know we're dealing with here when it comes to sports better right like maybe you had an okay sunday right and you're four and four or you know you bet nine games you're five and four you're four and five but depending on when you made your purchase on that game you've either you know that's either one in the win column or one in the loss column now for me you know, I came in late. I'm like, okay, I saw a Detroit plus 10 at like minus 116. I'm like, we're capturing a key number. We're only paying a couple extra bucks, right? It was available at like one sports book. So I made a small bet on Detroit, right? Not remotely. You know, I don't think we even talked about this game on Friday. Not remotely a game that I necessarily wanted to be on. But once I got to 10, I'm like, okay, like we're making this bet, like just kind of out of obligation, right? But if you make the minus seven and a half that you had all summer to make, which you know, I probably should have bet the minus seven and a half at some point over the summer. I'm obviously just sort of, you know, wary, uh, especially of that hook. If it had touched minus seven, I certainly would have bet on San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like first and foremost, just an absolutely atrocious beat. Like it was one that was an absolute bonus for me. Again, a game that like, I didn't even really care that much about because I'm sweating the Steelers money line and the Eagles money line, the Cardinals money line, all the stuff that we talked about on Friday. And so like, great bonus for me, but yeah, shopping, getting your price in now. Right. And I know that I'll, let's put it this way. There's a faction of, you know, the betting internet, the betting Twitter verse, right. That thinks they invented sports betting. And, you know, if they'll tell you that if you're making bets on Sunday, like you're too late, right? Like you're, you know, you're an yeah, idiot yeah. for betting on Sunday because all the value has gone because we were all betting it on Monday. And it's like, mm -hmm. to a degree, that's true, right? But if the lines are going to move to the point where win probability starts to pick up in the case of the Detroit Lions here, now again, they got smoked, right? Mm -hmm. From an app, you know, you're, you're sitting there halfway through the fourth quarter and you're like, minus 10, minus whatever, like wouldn't, shouldn't have mattered, right? But this is the NFL, right? Everything magnetically gravitates back to zero, right? It gravitates back to win because San Francisco doesn't care about covering the spread. This isn't college where now you're starting to seep in, you know, the betting scene and these coaches are like, what's the line? 34 and a half, like let's score a touchdown with 30 seconds to go when we're up by four touchdowns. Doesn't work that way in the NFL, right? Like they are just happy to win a game. Doesn't matter whether it's against the Lions or against the Texans, you know, speaking of the game um, <laughs> that we talked about. And so like fundamentally, it's like, yeah, okay. If, you know, you missed out on minus seven and a half, you're sitting there at minus eight and a half or minus nine going like, well, what are the odds it lands on eight? But if it does, right, like that changes your record. There's only 200 and, you know, what, 80 games in, in the season now. And so at the end of the year, let's say you bet on half of those, you know, 140 games, you know, the difference between going 71 and 69 or 70 and 70 is already, you know, built into yeah. whether or not you won on that game, if you bet that game, right? And so there wasn't a ton of games that came down to the point spread in that way. A lot of them, like last night's game, could have certainly gone either way from a point spread standpoint. But when we're talking about physically line shopping and that game landing on eight, like, yeah, that was the worst beat of the week. If you were on um, San Francisco late, 
or if you were on Detroit early. I don't know why you would ever be on Detroit early, <laughs> knowing that that number was kind of the only way it was going to go before the game yeah. was go up to eight or eight and a half. Right. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, but again, like if you come in late and you get a, the best of the number that week, in this case, Detroit plus 10 or obviously even plus nine and a half ended up working out. That's going to benefit you in the long term. So again, price shop, you know, pick your side, find out whether or not you think that line is going to move. That's part of the name of the game, right? Is this line going to go up, going to go down? And am I getting the best of the number on Monday? Or can I wait till Sunday at 1258 to get the best of the number going against the grain here? Totally love it. Totally love it. And just as much as I loved your your little sneak in there of the Texans, another game that we were all over just in terms of wait. Jacksonville favored by three against anybody right. on the road. What? Right. That makes no sense at all. So, you know, yes, enough of patting ourselves on the back. Let's get to, yeah, you know, true. sometimes you got to do it when it happens though. Right. Cause there's going to be other weeks where we're going to be here. Like, and I'm just going to be cheesed. So <laughs> we got to ride that wave. We got to ride that wave. But in terms of the overall right. week, and as I look at this week and you think of what's the theme of this week and being week one, the term overreaction comes up a lot. Am I, am I wrong there? No, it's, I mean, that's, that's it, right? Like week two is the overreaction week. And it also just means that we're going to make some absolutely stinky bets, right? Because we've seen <laughs> one game and it's like, we re, we always talk about this, right? Like we watch the game on Sunday or Sunday night or Monday night or Thursday or whatever. And like, we just replay it in our head like seven times or maybe like 70 times between now and the next week, right? Because there aren't any other games, right? NBA, NHL, certainly obviously Major League Baseball. It's like you play a bad game, you play the next day or two days later and it's washed, right? We already kind of, we don't lose our heads, you know, because the Toronto Maple Leafs lost three to nothing in the opening game. Like, well, some people do, but you know, the general public doesn't. Same thing with (laughs) basketball, right? The Bulls lose by 20. Like it's not, you know, the sky is falling. Everybody gets fired, right? Not the case in football. Like we sit here and we play these games over and over and over, right? The Cardinals have blown out the Titans like five times since that game actually played because we keep thinking about that game. So what that means is that there's going to be value on teams going forward and it starts the pattern, right? Mm -hmm. There's like this, like, you know, hip hop, like beat or something like that when it comes to the NFL season, where it's like, you see these games and not every game is like this. There's maybe two, three, I mean, week one, there's certainly a lot of them, but there are games where nobody wants anything to do with one side, right? Like we talked about, obviously New Orleans, we talked about Houston very briefly, but like, that's the point. Like nobody wants anything to do with those teams. Then they win. And then the next week, maybe there's a matchup and it's not going to be the case with Houston necessarily, but I think it might be the case with the Saints, right? Where it's like, I, and listen, I was all over the Saints. We just talked about that. But like mm-hmm. now they go on the road and they're favored by three and a half points at Carolina. And yeah, they might win. They might cover and all of those sorts of things. But like, I just had to talk a bunch of people into the Saints last week, including yourself. Mm-hmm. And now I'm going to have to talk a bunch of people out of the Saints this week as road favorites think about that for a second right because of one game and so you know the saints had all of this time to you know put together a game plan you know the packers didn't know what they were necessarily going to get from the saints offense but now all that stuff's on tape and so carolina's at home and listen they didn't look fantastic against the jets right like the jets speaking of downgrades or 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 keep them where we graded the jets before (laughs) the season Right. Like they didn't look particularly great. But again, like, are we going to beat up Carolina because Sam Darnold in his first game with a bunch of new players? Right. Like, are we going to beat on beat up on them for not looking amazing in a game that they won still pretty comfortably against an NFL football team? And so it's like, okay, now we're going to talk people out of the Saints this week. And it's just funny how you can sort of hit that every single week. And whether that ends up being the Saints, I remember the Patriots were like, were like that for us last year, where it was like we had to talk people into the Patriots yeah. against the Ravens. And then they would go to Houston the next week and be favored. And we we're like, we got to talk people out of the Patriots the next week. And then the yeah. next week they'd be at home to like Arizona. <laughs> and it was like, got to talk people in to the Patriots again it's like that's how this works right because all these teams end up like eight and eight against the spread at the end of the season right with a couple of exceptions maybe getting like a 10 and six record obviously we're 17 games this year but in the past and so it's like they're gonna get to eight and eight against the spread somehow and it's going to be 
in these situations where like one week they're four point underdogs and they win by three, the next week they're four point favorites and they win by three. And it's like, yeah, they might be two and oh record wise, but they're still just one and one against the spread. So that's the theme of this week. When you're looking at games, first and foremost, look for your buy low spots, right? Look for your, you know, your situations where you're like, okay, like we might be overreacting to this team, but just remember what our feelings were going into the week one games and how, we're affected by that. And I think that one is a really, really good example of just being like, all right, sorry. Like the saints flag has to come down this week because people might be getting a little bit excited, uh, overexcited about the saints. And there's, you know, every week that's going to be a theme. So it's nice to get that going early on because it's, you know, as much as we loved week one, like there's still 17 more of these. Lots of time left indeed. But as we switch gears to some college football here, because that was a wild weekend of college football action as well, where we had number 12 Oregon as 14 and a half point underdogs, but they pull out the upset win over Ohio State. Huge win for Oregon. You were we we talked about this one last week as well, yep. but Who else in the NCAA benefits from the Ohio State loss, getting the biggest loss of the season so far? So the short answer is everybody, right? Like the sport (laughs) benefits. Like that's the bad news, right? Heavy is the head that wears the crown, right? And when you're Ohio State or, you know, Alabama, all of these other teams, we talked about the start of the season, right? There are five teams vying for four spots. And it seemed really unlikely that it would be anyone other than those five teams. But what we needed right? What we needed is Oregon, a very good team. A lot of people sort of hyping them as the sleeper. And listen, we can kind of talk about that for a second too, as far as like, listen, they win that game and they're, you know, plus 400, plus 500, plus 600, depending on your book. Right. And, you know, the, the point was, is like for Ohio state to lose a game this season in the regular season, they're going to have to do so as two touchdown, you know, favorites. And there were two touchdown favorites on the road against Minnesota, two touchdown favorites here. Right. And yeah, they lost. Right. And so yes, we had no investment in, in the Ohio state Buckeyes. We were on the plus 14 and a half, you know, felt a little like we were on an Island there, especially when Oregon was missing two of their top defensive players. But even if you were like, yeah, I got my 50 to one Oregon bet. Right. Problem is like, you could have just made the money line bet at say plus 400 taking that money. And now the adjustment is that they're 20 to 25 to one, right? Ooh. And so if you take it, if, t- if you took that 4X that you already won and you just put it now on them at 20 to one, that's mm-hmm. 80 to one, right? So like in the most simplest way possible, it was just way more viable for you to bet on uh, Oregon to win outright here because them beating Ohio State was the only way that they were going to end up potentially uh, qualifying for the college football playoff, right? So when we're looking at a team like Oregon who has to go undefeated, you know, you don't have to parlay necessarily their money lines over and over and over again, though that's not the worst idea. Um, (laughs) But it's just find that one big game that is going to put them in the conversation that is going to make them, you know, sort of a top five type, you know, team here going forward. And so, you know, that's just a little explanation on why we wouldn't necessarily have bet them before the season started at 50 yeah. to one as sort of attractive as that looks now you go, wait a minute, like, you know, we can kind of synthetically make that 80 to one, but who does this benefit? Well, first and foremost, Oklahoma, you know, the team that we were on before the season started Georgia and Alabama, right? Like both of those teams, if they go undefeated the rest of the way, they're going to face each other in the sec championship game. You know, whoever loses still probably in the college football playoff. Uh, obviously yep. Oklahoma, now they don't have to worry necessarily about like a resume, you know, comparison with Ohio state once time comes to select those four teams, but the other teams that benefit the PAC 12, right? Like PAC 12's garbage. Like look at how bad they were in week <laughs> one, like Oregon almost lost to Fresno state who like appears to be pretty good now that we sort of start comparing and contrasting some of these teams, but like, you know, Washington's awful. And like, you know, USC just fired Clay Helton and they lose to Stanford. And it's like, this whole conference is garbage. It's like, let's not drag one team because the rest of the conference or a lot of the other con, you know, the, uh, a lot of the teams in the conference aren't doing so well here, but what that leaves right now with USC and Utah also both losing, speaking of a game that we talked about and taking the points with BYU on Friday, it means Oregon, Arizona State, and UCLA all now at least have some 
a path, right? They have the yeah. respect. So if you beat Oregon, you are now the team that beat the team that beat Ohio State, <laughs> right? If you are at Arizona State or UCLA, right? Same thing, UCLA gets that win against LSU. So they've got that, you know, sort of pelt on their wall that anybody who beats UCLA gets kind of credit for in reverse, right? And so you can look at those and you can kind of now pick one for a national championship type of a bet or at least make the college football playoff. And at least it's possible, right? At least it's not like, oh, there's going to be five undefeated teams in each of the conferences. And like Alabama and Georgia are going to, you know, take up two spots just from the SEC. And like the Pac-12 will be sitting there with an undefeated team, like just holding the bag, wondering what went wrong. Now, you know, they still might not make it because like maybe all of these teams end up finishing nine and three, but at least you can now look yourself in the mirror if you now want to bet on UCLA or Arizona State or Oregon. One thing I want to circle, October 2nd, not that far away, right? Mm -hmm. Arizona State at UCLA. So there's, you know, already a showdown, early season showdown. So I'd lay off on betting either Arizona State or UCLA, see who wins that game, because that's going to be big for their resume, but it's not going to move their uh, their odds to win the national title that much because you know Alabama still exists and Georgia still exists, et cetera, et cetera. So like yeah. that's really important. That's gonna be a really important game to sort of see who wins, who has the inside track. Now both those teams have tricky games this week. Arizona State is at BYU and Fresno, you know, who gave Oregon everything they could handle. They are playing UCLA. So you know things are gonna get really interesting. We'll talk about that on Friday. And then the last team. Cincinnati, right? We talked about the five teams for four spots, but two of those teams now with Ohio State and with Clemson now have ugly losses, right? And so now you go, okay, well, if Cincinnati can go 12 and 0, right? That's going to get them in over Ohio State at this point. That's going to get them in over Clemson. And now again, you know, they might have to start comparing themselves to whoever gets out of the Pac-12 if there's an undefeated team there. But again, at least now there's a path for Cincinnati. But we talked to you and I before the season started about how we wanted to bet Cincinnati and the concept of them getting to the playoff. And like, we didn't want them to win the national, we didn't want to bet them to win the national championship because they're going to be, you know, three touchdown underdogs to Alabama in the semifinal yeah. and then even if they win that they're going to be two touchdown Alabama and uh, underdogs to Oklahoma or, or Georgia or whomever but how do we want to bet that we wanted to bet Desmond Ritter Heisman right because if he is the key guy which of course he would be with the Bearcats if he's the guy leading them to the playoff yeah. he's still sitting there he was 60 to 1 before the season started he's still sitting there at 28 to 1 right mm-hmm. and they've got a game against Indiana this weekend And they still have a game against Notre Dame on the schedule, right? And as much as Notre Dame looked a little shaky in the last couple of days, they're still Notre Dame. So, right, like if you're looking for ways to bet kind of that fourth team, right? We talked Cincinnati with Desmond Ritter, Heisman, and then trying to figure out which Pac-12 team might have the best rep. Now, it's no guarantee. They might not end up making it. They might all finish nine and three because they're all going to lose to each other. (laughs) Entirely possible. But what that loss for Ohio State meant, right, it meant everything for all of these other teams. And it already turned two weeks into the season, the narrative around that you and I were talking about with regards to five teams, four spots. It's now a bunch of teams for four spots. So that's at least something, right? Yeah, I love it. And you also mentioned you touched there on the the Heisman watch, which is something we're going to jump back into each and every week as well. And with what's going on with Cincinnati, that initial pick you made still sounds even better at this point, but what else is going on when we think about the Heisman trophy watch after the first couple of weeks here in the NCAA? Um, so we talked about the PAC 12, right? And you go, okay, same sort of deal, right? As, as Ritter, where it's like, if there's an undefeated PAC 12 team, We don't necessarily love the team to beat Alabama once we get to the college football playoff, right? Mm -hmm. But if that team looks good enough to get to the college football playoff, there's probably a key guy involved, right? So CJ Verdell had a million yards on against Ohio State, a bunch of touchdowns, right? Running back. It's, you know, the Heisman Trophy is kind of the only award that still gives some credit to running backs (laughs) these days in, you know, NFL and college football. Uh, So CJ Verdell, 25 to one, right? So around the same price as Oregon to win the national title. So same kind of deal as Ritter, right? Where it's like, how about we skip the whole needing to beat Alabama thing? And how about we just bet on somebody who's going to put up a bunch of stats on the way to potentially an undefeated season? So we talked about, well, 
well, okay, we're not guaranteeing Oregon's even going to be the team to get out of the Pac-12. So what's going on? Arizona State, Jaden Daniels, right? He's 40 to 1. So if you like Arizona State, right, who hasn't really had a test yet this season, mm-hmm. that one's coming this weekend against BYU. And then, of course, UCLA, right, with Dorian Thompson-Robinson at 50 to 1. So if any of these guys' teams go undefeated in the same way that if Cincinnati goes undefeated, there's a decent chance they get a ticket to New York for a Heisman ceremony. Now, again, does that mean they're going to beat Bryce Young, who is the, you know, almost odds on at this point favorite, depending on your sports book, to win the Heisman? Again, it's just been a couple of games. Who knows what necessarily is going to happen with the Alabama quarterback? But the one I want to talk about, and we're, you know, we can talk about this for the pick segment on Friday, because I think that most fascinating thing this week is the Alabama game, not because I necessarily think they're going to lose against Florida, but Anthony okay. Richardson is mm-hmm. the, you know, quote unquote backup quarterback for the Florida Gators. And Dan Mullen has put in Emory Jones to start these games in the first two. And he has looked meh, right? Like they've beaten <laughs> up on Florida Atlantic. They've beaten up on South Florida. Like everybody does that. And he's looked meh. And the Gator Nation is going, can we get Anthony Richardson in there? Because Anthony Richardson has come in for a few snaps. And basically every time he touches the football, it turns into a touchdown. Like he had like three, he had like three passes this past week for 150 yards and like three touchdowns, <laughs> right? He's running all over the place. And so yeah. the, the big question this week, and you know, hopefully we'll have some answers to it, but I would actually be surprised if we did by Friday. The big question is, is Dan Mullen really not going to start his best quarterback against Alabama? Like, is that really the plan, Daniel? Like, are you really (laughs) looking to do that? Or is Dan Mullen a genius and he's only used this guy just to get some reps, right? Just to get a couple of reps in. Mm -hmm. And then like, he's going to unveil him, right? Like he's going to like take a cloak, like a magician (laughs) and there's going to be smoke. And then here comes Anthony Richardson. And it's like, Anthony Richards starting. Oh God. Like, you know, Nick Saban never saw it coming. Like Sabes is pretty good. He's going to be able to get this thing figured out one way or another. You'd think they're 14 and a half point favorites. But like, that's what I'm going to be interested in looking at because Anthony Richard, Richardson, excuse me, right now is a hundred to one to win the Heisman. And there's nothing more Heisman-y than like the Gators pulling off an upset, him superheroing, you know, mixing metaphors here, but he's, he's coming out of a phone booth here to knock off Alabama. Like, doesn't that guy, if that happens, doesn't he shoot up from like a hundred to one to like four to one all of a sudden and now again maybe Mullen doesn't play him maybe he plays him two three snaps and he does it the way that he's been doing it against South Florida in which case it's moot they're not going to win that game anyway so when we're talking about ways to bet games like if you think Florida has any hope to beat Alabama this weekend forget the money line let's just go long term and just and think of it as Anthony Richardson saving the day here and pulling off this crazy potential upset so I don't know that he's going to announce it anything you know anything this week I certainly wouldn't if I was him but that's the question right is he crazy enough to not play Anthony Richardson for a full <laughs> game given what we've seen out of the youngster from Florida I totally love it and as we kind of tiptoe into the next week of football games there are midweek games that we can place some bets on so let's start there and we'll stick with the ncaa we have ohio at louisiana the raging cajuns favored by 20 points that's a lot of points i'd never like laying that many points but what do you think my dude Where, where are you leaning here Yeah, I don't like laying that many points either until you look up and it's 21 nothing at the end of the first quarter. Uh, I was just looking, I was just checking my phone right now to see if it's if it's changed. Um, I'd love to get 21. Can we get 21? Anyone like auctioneer voice like, you know, 21, 21, 21. Um, Can we get 21 points here and back Ohio. Now it's been ugly for Ohio, right? They come out first game of the year and they score nine points against Syracuse. And we all think of Syracuse as this team that flat out stinks, right? Like they got worked over last year, right? But as much as we don't want to overreact to week one, whether it's college or the NFL, like we do have to take something from these games, right? And so week two rolls around and we were on Rutgers last week, you know, pat on ourselves on the back for a winner there. But like, that was way harder than I thought it was going to be. And Rutgers only scored 17 against Syracuse. So why is Syracuse relevant in all of this? Well, Syracuse defense might be okay, right? Like might not be a dumpster fire. Now they'll probably lose a bunch of games this season and maybe by blowouts against some of the best teams in the ACC, but we should be giving Syracuse a little bit more credit. And when we give Syracuse a little bit more credit for how good their defense was, we then have to sort of 
ease up a little bit on beating up Ohio, who is only a one point underdog going into that game. So the market decided that Ohio was about as good as Syracuse. And yeah, it didn't go great for them. But from a total yard standpoint, it was 346 to 383 in that game. So they got 346 yards against that Syracuse defense. Meanwhile, Rutgers only had 195 yards in that win against Syracuse. So Ohio actually did better offensively than Rutgers did. But Rutgers wins the game, Ohio doesn't. Now, the problem is Ohio then loses last week to FCS Duquesne, which is not (laughs) even a really good FCS team. It's not even a good team at all. Is that team uh, related to uh, Bishop Sycamore by any chance? Or That's right, yeah. (laughs) There's a whole regal lineage, like, yeah, I mean, it's just too much time to get into it. Um, But meanwhile, right, like Lafayette, who everybody was like hot pick against Texas in week one, didn't work out. Texas truck them and they did so right think about Texas for a second right like they beat up on Lafayette and then they go to Arkansas and they get trounced to the point where the starting quarterback is already gone right Casey Thompson who I don't know why he wasn't the starting quarterback from the start of the season but like now he's in and so it's like what am I supposed to love necessarily from the Raging Cajuns first two games that means that I should be laying three touchdowns now there's a brand element there and obviously Ohio not the biggest brand in the world but like the Raging Cajuns people love betting on the Raging Cajuns so are we going to get to 21 that would be awesome but even if we have to settle for 20 I just don't understand how this game isn't like relatively low scoring. I think Ohio can move the ball on the Raging Cajuns just because the Raging Cajuns survived last week's game against Nichols State. Speaking of <laughs> FCS teams that aren't that good, right? Like yeah. one team loses by two, the other team wins by two against pretty similar competition. Again, I just don't know where this whole Raging Cajuns 20 point favorite thing is necessarily coming from. That's a ton of points. So, yeah, if we're talking Thursday night football. Maybe mm-hmm. on the second screen, have Ohio, uh, you know, plus 20. Sweat that out a little bit on Thursday night. And speaking of Thursday night football, obviously there's another matchup as we go back to the NFL. And you mentioned low scoring. Well, we've got the right. Giants at the Washington football team. And for more on this game, for sure, we always like to, to send you towards more information because we like – giving out information here on this podcast. But for more on this game, you can head to drf.com slash sports where a guy, Scott Grambling, is expecting a low-scoring game. And he says, in part, the Giants have tended to play relatively low-scoring games away from home recently. And with the under having gone 8-2-1 and over the past 11 New York road games. The under is 15-6-1 in Giants-Washington games since the start of 2010, which includes a 6-2-1 under record over the past nine games in this head-to-head series. Overall, the under is 13-3-1 in Giants games since the start of last season. That's a lot of unders, unders, and more unders. Makes for an ugly game, but is there something else that we can take from that as we look towards the line in this game, which is the football team being three-point favorites here? We know Fitzpatrick is out, (laughs) which (laughs) the Fitz magic didn't even get to begin, but short week, Thursdays are always crazy. I don't like, like laying points when you're involving all these crap, well, the past few years, <laughs> crappy <laughs> NFC East teams, right? I don't like yeah. laying the points, but which side are you leaning here? Yeah, listen, I think it's safe to say that both teams are crappy. Like that's fine okay. by me. I don't think I don't think anything's I changed. Totally I, was... I don't think I don't think that's I don't think that's an overreaction by any means. <laughs> uh, my favorite, I don't even say favorite as if it's actually my favorite, but let's just you know use that term. My favorite stat, right? Daniel Jones here. The guys, you know, in, in, this is incredible. So you'll recall his debut, right? Danny Dimes, right? He comes in, takes over for Peyton Manning against Tampa Bay. They, you know, him and Jameis have a good old fashioned shootout, and they basically win at the gun right since yeah, then Eli, so yes. our guy our guy Danny in 25 starts is 7 and 18 in those starts right like not great bob so but here's <laughs> the thing here are the teams that he's beaten in oh. his career right there was a week 17 win against Dallas last year okay not the most exciting thing that's ever happened uh, in the universe uh he's beaten the philadelphia eagles last season and he beat the cincinnati bengals last season after joe burrow got hurt there are four other games that he has won here is the list of those teams <laughs> washington washington 
Washington and Washington. My guy is 4-0 <laughs> against the Washington football team and 3-18 and against the rest of the league. And one of those teams was a Week 17 Cowboys team without Dak Prescott. One of those teams was a Cincinnati Bengals team who, you know, finished what, third, fourth, last in the league last year, you know, and would have been even worse if they had, you know, we're missing Joe Burrow for the whole season, but like the Joe Burrow list Cincinnati Bengals, like he doesn't beat anyone Mm -hmm. except for Washington. Right. And so we've already seen this line. Like this was a look ahead of like five and a half. This is the funniest part about all of this. The look ahead line for this game was like five and a half points, right. With Washington being favored. Now Ryan Fitzpatrick gets hurt and Taylor Heineke comes in. And like, I don't know where you're at with Taylor Heineke right now, you know, now, but like that was fun last year in the playoffs. And like, he certainly, what did he cover teaser numbers? I think for us. And like, maybe <laughs> I think he even covered like late numbers in, in that playoff game against the bucks. And like, that was really exciting, but it all feels a little smoke and mirrorsy with Heineke. Like he had a couple of throws that were just like, chuck it up for Terry McLaurin. And like, somehow it worked out type of a thing. And so this number goes down, right? When it comes, you know, reopens in a line four, three and a half, right? And then everybody comes in on Monday and we wake up on Tuesday and the line's down to three, right? So it's drifting, drifting, drifting towards the Giants. Now we just preached, hey, like shop for the best number, et cetera, et cetera. Rather than just take the points here, isn't it just kind of worth a shot that like Daniel Jones, for whatever reason, just kind of has Washington's number? Right. And like the money line at like a plus 150, something along those lines, it kind of feels like either Washington's going to win this by like two touchdowns or the Giants are going to win it outright because Daniel Jones has some weird voodoo against Washington. <laughs> I'm going to steal. I'm going to steal a stat. I, you know, I caught your caught your boy Scott Grambling's thing, but to steal a stat from him. Ron Rivera, if you want to know the exact stat, you can go to the you can go to the article. But Ron Rivera is just flat out not good on Thursday nights, right? (laughs) He's just not good covering spreads. He's not good winning games, right? Obviously, a lot of that was with Carolina. I'm sure you recall a bunch of Thursday nights shaking her head about what Cam Newton's doing out there, right? So, like, to beat up Washington for that doesn't necessarily, you know, isn't the most fair thing. But, like, it just tells me that he just hasn't had his teams prepared on short weeks. Now, I don't know if Joe Judge is necessarily any better than, you know, than he is at this. But Joe Judge comes from the Patriots who were always prepared for those Thursday night games. So, you know, I just think there's a couple of reasons to like the Giants. Obviously, they looked bad on Sunday, but they're still getting the money. Like, it's funny that, like, we could all just, you know, sh- you know, set sail on the Giants here and be like, no, hard pass. But, yeah. like, money's coming in on the Giants, right? And so whether it's not loving Taylor Heineke, not loving Ron Rivera, or loving Daniel Jones for two games per year against <laughs> Washington, like, that's where the money's headed. And it makes sense to me because, you know, I, I, listen, the Daniel Jones owning Washington thing doesn't make sense to me, but the money moves on this make sense to me. So, yeah, in some form or, form or fashion, I, I'm going to be on the Giants on Thursday. This is where I jump in once again to say, take the points. Take the <laughs> points. I'm joking, I'm joking. I'm joking. But something along those take, lines here. Case, well, in this case, take the value, right? Take the money yeah. line. Take the take the take the extra money, right? Take the mm-hmm. plus 150, right? Which is just sort of a second cousin or a cousin or a sister to uh <laughs> taking the points, right? It's it's all it's all in the same family, one way or another. <laughs> I gotcha. I gotcha. Well, what a great way to recap the start of the NFL season. This was just so much fun again because. The Tuesday pod, it's whatever's going on, it will always be entertaining because we're celebrating or I'm going to be cheesed and and crying and trying to figure out what to do to bounce back in the following week. But as of now, we're doing pretty good. And so I was so happy that you were able to bless us again. And hopefully you will stop by again on Friday to keep the hot hand going. Stay hot, Mr. Russell. Stay hot. In the meantime, though, where can the people find you on social media? Yeah, at MRUS Authentic is the Twitter feed, M R U S S, and then Authentic, all one word, if you will. Uh, you can find everything that I do over the score uh, on that feed as well. And celebrating, commiserating, a lot of celebrating, like you said, this week. You know what? Maybe week two, maybe we're wrong with some of these stinky bets that we're going to make, and we have to do some commiserating. 
that's part of the fun too. But the good news is we've got this nice pot of gold after week one, right? Where we can give a little bit of it back just to make the sports books feel a little bit better about themselves. Um, but we don't necessarily have to. And Lord knows we're not going to try. So yeah, you can catch me there at Emrus Authentic on Twitter. And uh, brother, uh, happy to come back on Friday. Uh, I know that I kind of have to, right? After week one. Got to stay hot. Got to stay hot. Thanks again, man. Appreciate it. Thanks again to Matt for joining me. And if you want to follow along on Instagram, you can check me out at Sheldon Alexander and on Twitter at Shell Alexander. And for more exclusive data, analytics, previews, videos, and expert picks on all the major sports, head on over to drf.com slash sports. You can also like us on Facebook or subscribe to the DRF Sports YouTube page. That's all I got for now, but don't forget to rate, like, and follow the pod wherever you get your podcasts. We're here twice a week, Tuesdays and Fridays on the DRF Sports Podcast. So until next time, I'm Sheldon Alexander. See ya. Thanks for listening to the DRF Sports Betting Podcast. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show. For more sports betting advice, go to drf.com backslash sports and follow on Twitter at DRF underscore sports.